Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the ACI Learning IT Pro Cybersecurity Podcast. A little bit of a different format from our normal all things cybersecurity uh, webinar format, but still a lot of fun and kind of along the same idea, a little more intimate, a little bit bringing it close, getting in together. Right and doing fun things. And today, you're going to have the opportunity, don't forget, to actually ask us questions. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have a guest on. We ask questions. We answer questions. It's a good time had by all. I know it will be for me, hopefully for you as well. And that is the format of the show. So if you look around, you'll probably find yourself a little chat area in which you can participate in today's podcast. So put your questions in those chats. Send them to us. We've got a team of you know, rabid monkeys or something in the background that are monitoring these things and making sure that uh, cool questions get pulled up and brought into us so that we can discuss and hopefully learn a thing or two from each other. That's the whole idea behind this series. So thanks for joining us today. And speaking of joining us today is our special guest. Now, typically I like to reach out and look for at least a, a friend of mine in the industry or someone that's really cool. Jerry here follows under both of these categories. One, Mr. Gerald Osier from Simply Cyber. Jerry, we're glad to have you today, man. How's it going? It's going fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and just seeing where the where the chat takes us today. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of good times. Uh, typically, that chat brings the thunder with some really interesting questions. So I hope you brought your A game today. Now, for those of you that are uninitiated, that don't maybe uh, maybe you're not familiar with Jerry's background. Um, He's, you're very into the GRC, and it was funny. So we were talking, sitting around the uh, campfire, as it was, at Wild West Hackenfest this year. And, you know, Jerry said, my my goal in life is to make GRC. And I said, you know, uh, cool again. And he said, no, at least socially acceptable. <laughs> and, you know, we had to laugh out loud because th it is kind of the, the thing of it. GRC's got a bit of a stigma behind it as being a bit dry. But uh, nonetheless, still very extremely important. You kind of make this your stock and trade. If anybody can do it, Jer, it is you, good sir. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. You know, like when I started Simply Cyber and started, you know, talking about this, a lot of the questions that you get from people who are new to the industry are around red team and then offensive. And, and Blues really came on the scene, the SOC analyst job, uh, the last couple of years. So it was really around those so I was thinking, okay, I'll, I'll lean into those. But because my uh, career has taken me over, uh, you know, several iterations of GRC over the last 18 years, I do have a lot of experience there. So, you know, I would occasionally get asked, I'd lean into it. And then I began to realize someone introduced me as the GRC guy. And I was like, all right, like, let you know what, let's lean into this. So yeah, I uh, made that GRC course. I talk about GRC all the time there. It has real value and i think once people you know pull back the uh the, the the wrapping paper if you will or rip off the wrapping paper uh because it's got great wrapping paper frankly um and you begin to realize that it's not just audit it's not just going down a checklist for compliance purposes like you can actually influence where cybersecurity spend is being made you can collaborate with the um you know the blue team on their threat intelligence like what are you seeing does the policies policies make sense like let's Hey, like let's enable the business over here. They need to be able to remotely access these things for X, Y, and Z reason. You know, what how can we achieve this goal so the business can be enabled and we as practitioners can feel that we're doing our job to protect the organization? So GRC does have its place. And once you realize that, it can be very, very cool. But you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, Daniel. So I'll just slowly, brick by brick, uh, build up the GRC coolness uh, situation. Yeah, sir. That is that is all we can ask of you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you will do a phenomenal job spearheading that. <laughs> like I said, if anyone can do it, it's that guy right there, ladies and gentlemen. So, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he knows his stuff. So listen to him. If you're not listening to the Simply Cyber podcast, you should definitely check that out. His morning briefings are great as well. Uh, you got a lot of great content out there, and really thank you for your your effort that you put out into the community. It is highly needed and mm -hmm. is appreciated. So there's that. That said, I say we start taking some questions from the old chatterific because I'm sure there's a few people out there that are probably like, y y you're telling me I get to ask questions and you, you might actually answer these questions. Yes. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the name of this game. That's what we like to play. So I look forward to getting into this and I really, I'm because I don't come from that GRC background, I really anticipate and hopefully get to see a lot of these questions to, because I'm just as interested as other people are to hear your answers on this and see how, because a lot of times, and, and you tell me if I'm off on this, or at least from your experience, that even though I don't work in that space, 
it's like you said, everything kind of overlaps. Everything works together. It's meant to kind of come together and, and mesh. So I, I like to see how what I do like to do meshes with that area. And it gives me that, that point of contact, right? That common ground in which I can have those conversations and make my skills or how I'm teaching people to have stuff more effectiveness into mm -hmm. that, right? So that said, we do have our first question. I know I go on all day long. Uh, we got a question from a one Mr. Rich. This says, when it comes to blue team, what happens when you start seeing everyone as a red team member, even other employees? Yeah, so I guess, you know, as a blue team member, your your responsibility is to defend the organization. And it's kind of aligned with GRC. If we're gonna if we're gonna keep going to that GRC well today, it's around, you know, true risk reduction, right? You can't you can't stop all the things, but you can certainly uh, introduce barriers and hurdles that make it uh, less, you know, uh, less impactful if things are compromised and a, more of a challenge to uh, actually do it. So the likelihood uh, goes down. Now, if you're seeing everyone as a red team member, even other employees, you know, I would argue again, leaning into GRC, you know, a lot of times blue team members are heads down on a keyboard and I love my blue team uh community okay so don't don't take this as a slight but you know you're looking at the you know the eye candy knock board you're, you're banging on the sim you're talking about like give me the net flows and look at all this and we got beaconing yeah that's all great and stuff but if you're actually engaging with the business and talking to them and educating them in a way that is actually communicated to them effectively right so don't you can't talk to Carl in accounting about elite zero days and like Revo ransomware gang. You need to talk to them about, hey, like this, this is how Chrome extension malwares are being loaded. It's a pop-up. It's going to say that you need to install Adobe, not Adobe. So there's a misspelling there anyways. And this is a pop-up that you shouldn't be clicking on. Educate them. And then they'll stop being threat actors in your environment because um, essentially, um, in the absence of knowledge, people make the best decision for themselves um, that they think is risk reduction. And if they're uninformed, they're going to click on that pop-up or be unaware altogether that the pop-up could even be malicious. So I, I, I guess I would say to the question, you know, you can at least mitigate the risk down of your end users being uh, threat actors uh, or introducing additional risk to your environment. Um, but ha having said that also, you do need to uh, be mindful of your best practices with, um, you know, what are you looking for for indicators of compromise? What are you looking for on the network? Are people doing conditional access or are they logging at, at the at weird times? Are they an another thing, um, Daniel, that you'll see too is like, or or the person who asked the question, um, insider threats. A lot of times people will, when they're about to leave the company, right? They'll they'll start taking data out. So you know, if you're wanting to absolutely look at uh, your end users as threat actors or as red team operators, uh, anytime someone actually submits their two week notice, you should probably go back and look four weeks into the logs because typically people will exfil and then give their notice because they know the second they give their notice, they're going to show up on a on a radar. So I, I guess those are my questions. Not everybody's a threat actor, but you do need to kind of put guardrails in place to help people stay in their lanes and accidentally not introduce risk to your organization. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. You know, we we talk a lot in cybersecurity about buy-in, right? We talk a lot about stakeholders mm -hmm. and we can easily always put those in the lanes of, well, these are the C-suites and these are the decision makers. These are people with, you know, budgetary uh, control and those are gonna be my stakeholders. Th these are the people that I need buy-in from. But when you're talking about your cybersecurity ecosystem as a whole, you, all of a sudden buy-in becomes a different thing. Buy-in becomes, okay, how do I make my users less of a red teamer for me, right? And and start mm -hmm, to be a part mm -hmm. of that blue team. How, Like you say, how can we educate them? How can we get them on board? What are some easy things that we can give to them that they can sink their teeth into and feel like they're a part of the solution and that they're contributing to the overall security, you know, um, uh, 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 health of our organization. How can we make that happen? So I find that if you can really start to, like you said, get them around the water cooler, start talking about things that really impact them as an end user and not just at, in their work, but at home, you start to uh, uh, educate them on cybersecurity things. And then all of a sudden that's, that's an easy lift for them. They can just perform things like, oh, 
the, the rule of thumb is just don't click links in emails. Don't open attachment in emails. That's a simple thing. doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter where it comes from. I don't care if it comes from the president of the United States. Do not click on those things. Go to them. Reach out to them directly instead of following the easy path. Just make you a couple little things. Those are the kind of things you can easily give them. And they go, oh, okay. I know that this that's just my baseline. And then if something weird happens, it's cool for me to call someone and say something weird has happened. It's kind of that see something, say something. I've noticed that a lot of like back when I worked – in workstation support, when I was a sysadmin, network and security, uh, you know, people would be afraid to reach mm -hmm. out to us and say something weird is going on because they thought they were going to get in trouble. And we're yeah. like, no, you are our front lines. We need that. You are just as much an alarm as any of the systems that we've put in place to alert us to the fact that something weird might be going on because you are that human that has more intuition, that has more, hey, I know how this thing kind of works on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's acting different. Right. If you reach out to us going, I don't know what's going on. I just know it's doing something janky. Now we can go, well, let me let me start investigating this. And now they're a part of the team and you start treating them that way and they'll start acting that way. I, I, I think that's just my, my thought. I, I think that kind of goes along with what you were saying as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to take it even further, uh, you know, like you said, it's it's not just about them preventing from making bad decisions and introducing risk to your organization, but you can actually have them become um, de facto security champions in your organization. And one other thing that I would love to share with your listeners is one of the most effective things that I have seen in addition to making it common speak, right? Don't say leap technical zero day type stuff because they don't, it's not going to resonate. They don't care. What I have seen is most effective is if you personalize it. So for example, just two weeks ago, the IRS notified in the United States, the IRS notified that um, there is an uptick in smishing, right? So text message fishes around tax returns. And I sent that out to the end users and I told the Simply Cyber community exactly how to send it out to the end users, two sentences. And what the call to action was, was not that you should be aware of it and protect yourself, but you should tell your friends and loved ones because you don't want your friends and loved ones to get compromised, right? In this IRS thing. And by doing that, now you've got them actually going through the motions of sharing information security best practices, being that person that can provide value to the people that they care about, right? I, I, I love, you know, the company I work for, and I'm sure a lot of people love the company they work for, but at the end of the day, like you're more concerned with protecting you and the ones that you care about in, in a way that will never resonate to the way you think about your company. And if you can get in there and plant seeds at that level, then they start thinking like, okay, that's the way. And then when you send them other messaging, they are already tuned in to the frequency that you're broadcasting on to, to you know, make a metaphor here that they will uh, resonate, even if it isn't exactly uh, applicable to their friends and loved ones, right? But, you know, things like multi-factor, things about, you know, smishing and phishing campaigns. Oh, we got an uptick on FIFA uh, in Qatar. Like, you know, there's going to be a campaign coming, Black Friday, like whatever it is. When you start sending these messages out, you will get greater traction, which ultimately is the goal of end user awareness training. It's be it's behavior modification and adoption of what you're doing. And if you can demonstrate that it's value to them personally, that's going to be your biggest bang for your buck. I love, uh, you know, it's almost like cybersecurity inception, right? Where we're through the uh, various and sundry ways, uh, insidiously implanting these ideas in your head, but for your for your good, right? Is this all for your good stuff? All right, let's move on. We've got Dennis has a question for us. And Dennis's question is, why does every entry level opportunity in cybersecurity demand five years experience? Oh, man, Dennis, is, Dennis has been trying to get a job, I would assume. And he has been confronted with some very interesting facts around getting into cybersecurity. Jerry, what's your take on this and uh, what's your experience? Yeah, so this is a deceptively um, complicated answer for a what would appear to be a ridiculous uh, question. Not that Dennis's question is ridiculous, but that the fact that entry level would have any years of experience, let alone five years of experience. Uh, Dennis, let me let me share with you some explanations as to why, and then some hacks it, to, to take a take an arrow out of Daniel's quiver uh, and, and do some hacking here on how you can hack these uh, years of experience. So first of all, a couple things. One, cybersecurity 
Uh, sometimes you don't get funded. Sometimes you have a, a, a wish list of things, but then you're given budget for like, say, $48,000, which only goes into an entry level pay ban. So then the hiring manager is like, well, I need someone who's, you know, can sit down and immediately implement, you know, whatever, a SecOps program or a SIM or, or you know, deploy EDR across the organization because I don't know how to do it and I, I can only hire one person. So they put, here's the pay ban. So it's entry level. And here is the, um, experience requirements, frankly, in order to achieve this. And and it, it's unfair, absolutely. Now, another aspect is there's a bit of a misconception that you have to be super technical to be able to work in cybersecurity. And there are several roles that require you to have advanced level of technical experience. There are lots of roles that require you have foundational technical acumen. And there are roles that don't require much technical outside of understanding basically how a network is, uh, how a network works and how operating systems kind of function at a very, very basic level, right? This is my GRC people. So sometimes with the years of experience, it's not necessarily years of cybersecurity experience, but they'll be looking for someone pivoting from IT into um, InfoSec and they'll they'll lean on those years of experience. Now, to call it entry level, I think is is a is unfair and a complete um, just a pro, it's a blight on our industry, frankly, since we are struggling so bad to fill so many open positions. Uh, but but to put that aside, to give some hacks um, that I would offer, okay. So if it was me and I was like trying to get through this ridiculous uh, you know catch twenty two, a couple of things I would do. One, I would definitely definitely do labs, right? So practical experience right now is king, right? So, you know, education, super important, um, higher ed degrees, you know, certs, they have their places. But what I'm seeing in my world is that practical experience of the three of those elements, practical experience is the number one. So you, if you could do labs and ranges and get some experience, if you could possibly get on as IT and then start acting like a security champion, like, okay, so I'll dig into that in a second. So, if you do that, when you're writing your resume, don't put, you know, like under experience, experience is experience. I don't care if you worked at a company for four years and that's your experience. I didn't say job experience. I said experience. So you can put your lab work there. One of the most clever things I've ever seen is somebody actually had written their lab experience down, but they wrote it like it wasn't deceptive. It wasn't lying in any way, but they wrote it with the same format of like header for the role and then the bullet points underneath. And when I read their resume, it, you know, it stacked up like experience, experience. And then this other experience of them doing uh, like firewall configurations and EDR configurations and uh, detection engineering. I was like, oh man, this is great. This is just what I'm looking at. And then I, then I realized that it was just ranges, but it was just, but I don't care if you, if I can sit you down at the console and you can do the work that I need done, that's cool. I don't care if you worked at IBM or if you worked in a range that was set up that, to model a professional network environment and then you executed and learned. So that to me uh, is, is one way to kind of hack um, you know, that experience to get through the, the HR type stuff. Um, another thing that I would encourage, and I say this literally once a day, networking, like social networking, is literally the most important thing you can possibly do, okay? People have, you have to establish trust. Like if you're applying for that HR, okay, so entry level, five years of experience, right? But in reality, I don't really need five years of experience. I need someone to be able to do, I need someone who can who can sit down and work in Splunk, or I need someone who can sit down and work in Greylog or whatever, I don't care. If, if I have been networking with you, if I had a cup of coffee with you, if I talked to you in a Discord server, if I'm on this stream right now in chat, messaging back and forth with other people on stream in chat right now, and I start building these connections, and it's not a single point in time, but you will build a network and a community just like we do over at Simply Cyber. And then I know that you know how to use Greylog. I know you're looking to work, like you're trying to, you're a truck driver and you're looking to switch into cybersecurity and you've done all this experience and you just can't get the opportunity. Well, guess what? I'm the hiring manager. I can talk to HR about these five years of experience. I can adjust the requirements because oftentimes it's more of a wish list than it is an actual bare metal requirements list. So by networking, you 
you end up finding out about opportunities that never get posted. You are able to talk to people who can manip not manipulate, but modify what the actual requirements are, get you in for that interview, and get around uh, some of these obstacles and these impediments that are in many people's ways. So sometimes it's, it feels like we're trying to kind of read between the lines, interpret, if you will, the idea behind when you see, hey, we're looking for five years of experience for an entry level uh, job is what you're really looking for is uh, what someone might have with five years of experience into a job similar to this. So just start applying for and posting with the relevant experience and that can get you past that five year. And I, I don't know about you, Jerry, but I know a lot of people will tell you, and I, I do it myself. I say, just apply anyway. What's the worst they can do? Is just you know disregard or, or say no. You know nothing venture, nothing gain. Go ahead and throw your hat in the ring because you never know. Someone might go, oh, this is an interesting person. Let me go ahead and just because they they man they have a lot of experience. They don't have that five years of a cybersecurity person per se but they sure have a lot of cybersecurity experience. Let me go ahead and put them in the pile of uh, revisits, right? You never know who, where you might get. So go ahead and just apply anyway, label those experience things that you've done. Like you say, cyber ranges are great, CTFs, going to conferences, like you say, networking is probably one of the biggest things you can do to help you get past those weird, you know, HR or, you know, resume hurdles that you might be thinking, oh, I've got these big gaps and I'm never going to be able to cross them. You know, it's stinking Grand Canyon it might as well be. It doesn't matter. You know, the right people and people know and know you, the right people know you. Mm -hmm. it, all of a sudden that becomes okay. It's like, well, well, you're still cool by association. So we'll go ahead and give you a closer look, even though you don't meet our requirements per se. So I like where you're going with that, Jerry, that, that this isn't, it, it, these things can be a bit deceptive. Mm -hmm. And really what you got to do is go, if you see a job you like, th go for it, right? Just go ahead and try for it because you never know. Yeah, well, and I'd also point out, like I've seen this, uh, well, two things. One, I've seen this plenty of times, right? So I apply for the job. Like I, my rule of thumb is like, if you meet 50% of you know the requirements, um, you know, you have a good a chance with it, right? So I have seen this before. I have done this as a hiring manager before, okay? Rec comes in. We're trying to hire for a level, a level one, right? Um, like let's do this entry level role, right? And a resume comes in. Someone is just in a bad situation. They've got a lot of experience, but they're in a bad situation. They're applying to anything at this point just to get out of their job, and they work in the industry. And I'll, I'll look at it and be like, oh my god, like you know what? Like I, I, this this person is perfect for a need that I have, like, I don't even have a job opening for this, but this person is perfect for this pain point that I have over here. And I go get uh, a new rec filled or in tighter budget times, like right now where we're living, I'll go pull that level one and get it changed to a level two and directed for, for what my needs are. And that is, how, I've done that, right? So, you know, it's, it's about being seen. And that's, again, why networking is so important because um, if I know like, you know, that you're interested or what you can do, um, for me building cybersecurity programs, you know, they're very dynamic. They change. You can have like, you know, three year roadmaps on what initiatives you're going to grow and stuff like that, but you, it's always dynamic and you certainly need the right talent to do so help solve the right problems. And sometimes when you're applying to jobs, you know, you know, you're not a good fit for that job, but you are getting seen and, you know, it, it parlays into, um, you know, an another opportunity. So again, I can't promise that every time, but my point is that that does happen, um, especially in the information security world. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting. I'm looking at our next question here and it's kind of a nice segue where we're talking about experience and things that you need to be able to put on your resume. And they're kind of, this uh, question is from Gabriel it says, what are some good security frameworks? Speaking of how can I get some experience? What are some of these good security frameworks to follow or implement that are similar to like MITRE attack? Well, okay, so that's interesting and uh, love the question, Gabriel. F frameworks is like right up in GRC's wheelhouse. So I'm going to give you a high five uh, remotely on that one. So, you know, when you say similar to MITRE ATT&CK, I, you know, MITRE ATT&CK is a framework, but it's a very specific framework for helping uh, model threat actors and then being able to like set up red team events and, and, and you know, make sure your defensive posture actually aligns to whatever TTPs of threat actors that you're trying, that might target like your industry or your, you know, country or wherever. So there's a whole bunch of different things. What I would say 
um, as far as security frameworks to follow or implement. When I think framework, I'm thinking more of a comprehensive information security program. So MITRE ATT&CK is good for what it does, but MITRE ATT&CK is almost like, I don't want to call it like a specialized tool in the toolbox, but it's like, you know, a, a hand sander or something like that. Like you're not always going to use it. It's useful and it's got its place, but you're not always going to use it or like a sand wedge in your golf bag to use a different metaphor. Where when I think frameworks, I think of things like CIS 18, which used to be called CIS 20, which used to be called SANS 20. I think of NIST cybersecurity framework and then also something like ISO 27001. These frameworks provide you essentially uh, scaffolding and direction and scope on implementing an information security program. And it, it's not one size fits all, although CIS 18 tries its best to be as, as simple and, and one size fits all as possible. But the, the point is you can take these programs and implement them at your organization as a framework and then start beefing them out and building them out. And, and what makes you a capable professional is taking the framework and understanding that you know this section of the framework is more important than this section of the framework right now. Because I don't care how much, unless you have, even if you had infinite dollars and infinite people on your team, which you never would, you can't implement everything all at the same time. The business just can't sustain that much um, change in one section. Like, it, like I've rolled out multi-factor authentication at a thousand person company, which isn't that big. And it took three months. I mean, you have to communicate. You have to, you know, do change control, obviously. Then you've got to roll it out to a pilot group. You got to see what happens. You got to go order the hardware tokens because, you know, these guys over here in uh, Philly, uh, they, 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 they're they unionized and they don't want to use, like, use their own phone. So you have to buy hardware tokens for them. Uh, you know, Sally up in Boston doesn't even own a phone. So you've got to come up with all these things and then roll it out and then troubleshoot and then you're up and operational. So something as simple as multi-factor rollout isn't like you flip, you know, snap your fingers. So the frameworks allow you to stage and structure. And this is why you can have multi-year plans, like a three-year roadmap, because you're like, okay, here are my risks. Here's the framework we're using. My greatest risks are, you know, whatever, ransomware and remote access, right? Or business email compromise or something. So we're going to prioritize that up front. We don't have any detection capabilities. So we're going to put a SIM or an MDR up in the front at the beginning. We're going to do MFA and awareness training up at the beginning. And then we're going to slowly start maturing those while we start rolling out more advanced capabilities, right? Start doing asset inventory, start doing periodic checking, do pen testing maybe in a year or so, right? So th this is the framework. So to answer Gabriel's original question, I'm a huge advocate of NIST cybersecurity framework, which is a public private sector partnership that's voluntarily based. No one's required to implement it, but because it was developed with the uh, private sector um, it, across many, many different industries, and it's gone iterate, it's iterated over several times that it really is a best of breed framework. I'm a huge advocate of it. If your organization is large enough to roll it out, uh, if you work at a company that's probably like 50, um, you know, 50 to 100 people or less, you may want to go with CIS 18 just because it's a little bit easier and less cumbersome than cybersecurity framework. But uh, and if you're a student out there, right, a lot of IT Pro TV um, guests today are students or you're a lifelong learner like myself, CIS 18 is a great entry into frameworks because it's basically one to 18 and you're supposed to do one first, then two, then three. And by following the order, even if you just read it, you can begin to understand why it's structured the way it is. Number one is hardware inventory, right? What do we have in this environment? Number two, software inventory. Also, what do we have in this environment? Because if you don't know what's in the environment, how do you know if you're vulnerable to anything? How do you know when threat intel comes out if there's a problem? How do you know if Daniel set up a remote access over at IT Pro TV so he can come in and do some work on the weekends without physically coming in? I'm going right? to just stop talking right now, Jerry. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyways, uh, just to close that out, CIS 18 would be a great place to start, Gabriel, just to kind of wrap your head around frameworks. Yeah, and that's great. Imagine you you get some hands-on with that stuff. It's not like, like you said, you can just go and look up these things, start looking into them and get some familiarity with it, maybe even start implementing that stuff in whatever networks that you can. Uh, everybody here probably has a home network, right? You, which you are the security administrator of, and nobody can stop you from doing any of that thing. So uh, start taking what you can learn from that and apply where you can now you have real hands-on experience with that in a live environment 
And the other things you can just say, well, at least I have some familiarity with them. I can understand these frameworks a whole lot better. And I can start putting that kind of thing on my resume under my experience area. And hey, that's that that's good for you on the on the old res. All right, we got a question coming from Jose. Jose asks a little bit about GRC. How has GRC interest recently grown from small to medium companies based on the state of hacking attacks? How are they finding solutions internally or externally? Well, that's a fun question, Jose. So uh, th there's a couple parts to it. So first of all, GRC, if, if we just think of GRC as, because uh, we didn't really define it, but it's governance, risk, and compliance. And all you have to do is think about it this way to level set. GRC is the mechanism of the information security office that interfaces with the business, whether it's educating the end users, briefing management, or helping get budget to, you know, for whatever their initiatives are, right? They're the ones who are going out and doing things. Now, as hacking attacks, as ransomware has increased, as all of the, you know, type of cybersecurity events have increased over time, yes, GRC interest has grown, but I'll explain interestingly why. Over the last couple of years, ransomware has gone rampant. And part of the, you know, this is the best way to do it. This is how you do it approach has been to get cyber insurance. Almost all businesses have business insurance. And because the policy writers are like, hey, like, you know, we could throw on an extra $25,000 rider for cybersecurity insurance. You get popped, we'll pay for the Bitcoin or the ransom or we'll deploy an incident response team, whatever it is, right? Because the, the, the insurance company wants you to get back up and running uh, quickly too, right? That's why you pay for insurance. Well, as more and more companies got popped, the insurance companies are were losing money, frankly, right? So then they started upping their premiums and upping the scrutiny for which they are deciding whether or not to write policies for organizations and dictating what controls you need to implement before they will write you a policy. Or I've seen this also where like your policy is $100,000 and because you don't have multi-factor, because you don't have these, uh, these other things, it's 5X. So now it's a half million dollar policy. Uh, which is, you know, the premium, which is expensive, right? And the CFO is like, why is this so expensive? We pay it every year for a hundred grand. Why are you, is it a half million? And they're like, well, your security's terrible. And then the CFO is like, well, so if we put in a $25,000 MFA solution, our, our premium goes down $400,000. Yes, like even a child can do that calculus, right? No disrespect to CFOs, but like, that's the deal. So the insurance companies basically start pushing down security requirements and the business doesn't understand what the insurance company is saying. Literally, someone at the business wants to take the paperwork from the insurance company and throw it over a fence and say, someone deal with this. And that's GRC. That's the, Trust me, they don't want to deal with that. So they're going to hire someone, GRC, to do it or they're going to straddle the GRC responsibility with somebody else. But a lot of times... One of the first roles that gets hired into an InfoSec program is a GRC role, even if they're not calling it that. They might just call it InfoSec analyst. But the deal is your job is to deal with these questionnaires and deal with what is multi-factor authentication and can we just turn it on? How do we how do we roll it out? And that 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 is why GRC has grown, especially in the small and medium business size, because they need the insurance. And they're being told that they need to do these things to get the insurance. So uh, the other part of the question was around internally, externally. I would say it's more, you know, uh, externally, essentially from the insurance companies. But, um, you know, it, it also there's a lot of, it's called third-party risk management, but there's a lot of organizations now that like, if you want to do business with them, they will say, hey, before we do business or before we acquire you, which is, you know, a goal of a lot of small companies, frankly, but before we do that, we're going to do due diligence. And now part of that due diligence isn't just how much revenue you're making and what your sales funnel look like and all that, but also have you had any cyber attacks recently? Are you compromised right now? Because they don't want to buy a nightmare. Right. So who is filling that out? Who can answer those questions correctly or effectively? That's GRC. So, you know, yeah, you could have a SecOps person fill those questionnaires out, but they're heads down on keyboard, not wanting to deal with that. And and again, that's why that's why GRC does the business, because that request is coming in from the business by way of an external party. So GRC is doing a great job of kind of explaining why uh, this makes dollars and cents to the people that are having the influence on whether or not you get to have good security and they're going, Oh, I can, 
I can save money if we just stop sucking at security. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I, I think yeah. we should do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is true. You know what's the funniest thing? Um, it, it, people who are new to the industry might not know this, but Daniel, you definitely know this. It's like the better we are at our job, the less it looks like we're doing. And and that 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 they don't that like that paradox. Yeah, that paradox is really difficult to sell to management. They're like, why are you asking for an extra? Like you asked for a hundred grand last year for a budget. Now you're asking for 150. Nothing happened. Why do you need more money? It's like, oh my God, like nothing happened because I'm doing my job well. And because you gave me that money and now I need this other money for more bad stuff not to happen. You feel me? Right. Yeah, so right. like, let, let's do this. The fact that nothing is occurring is what you're paying for, right? Because <laughs> exactly. if something occurs, well, that's bad for everybody. Right. And, um, so yeah. we, we need more people to understand that. And actually, we've got our next question is from Helder. And he asks, uh, what is a good path to CISO? Obviously, we need good CISO. So Helder, please listen to what we're talking about today. And if you ever make it to that CISO level, you know, use that information. And they say, what knowledge and level of experience is needed to kind of like be at that level? Yeah. So, okay. So the tradition, so there's two kinds of CISOs, basically. There's uh, technical, very technical CISOs that come kind of up more of the, you know, SOC analyst path, if you will. And then there's the business minded CISOs. I would argue a lot of CISOs, um, a majority of CISOs, so greater than 50%. If I had to pick, I would say like 66 to 70% of CISOs uh, come up the GRC track because they are comfortable talking to the business because they understand what the business's needs are and why there is budget and why you can't just spend all the money and why you actually have to accept risk. And most importantly, because GRC people have been talking to the business over the year, you know, through your career, then you understand what is important to them. Again, I, I'll keep going back to this, like, you know, SOC analysts and pen testers and stuff like, yes, and in, in forensics examiners, yes. Like I am the first in line to tell you how cool it is to reverse a binary or to like rip apart a firmware on an IOT device. Like it is so cool, but the CEO does not care. The business cares about making money. That's why they're in business. And what you're talking about has nothing to do with that. And they will tune you out in a hot minute. And it is a learned skill to be able to communicate in a way that is succinct and effective to those business audiences. And you get a ton of that through GRC. So as far as, you know, path to CISO, you know, a, a, a traditional simple path would be starting an audit, right? Because audit is a great entry into GRC. Plus I would just pump, if you're looking, you know, and you, you're, you can move, right? You're very flexible in that way. The big uh, consulting firms, um, just to name a couple, if I, if I can, um, like Booz Allen, Deloitte, PwC, Accenture, Capgemini, SAIC, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, just to name a few. Just go, just go put your job search in DC, even if you're not going to live in DC, put your job search on DC and then put um, security auditor. Okay. There is a ton of US government work. And I'm sorry if you're not in the United States, I can't really speak to other countries, but there is tons of US government. Uh, FISMA or information security audit work out there. And you can get into an audit job. Um, and, and basically, you know, the way professional services work, you they pay you say 100 bucks an hour, but they charge the US government $200 an hour. If they don't have a body in the seat, they make $0 an hour. So those professional services companies are highly motivated to employ someone in that role. And ideally, more entry level, because frankly, they can pay you less because they can make the argument that your compensation package aligns to your experience. So then you get that entry level, you get a year, two, three, whatever of experience in audit, which is a very, very forgiving entry level role, because you're expected to be able to read, ask questions, you know, understand what the responses are, document them, and, and then, you know, go off and, 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 and do your audit work, right? Is it in place? Is it not in place? It's very forgiving and very uh, easy on-ramp, okay, into InfoSec. From audit, you can go into risk, which is probably the most important part of, of the GRC capability. And risk is just an extension of audit, right? So you don't have multi-factor authentication in place. An auditor says, not in place fail, and then reports findings at the end of the day. The risk analyst goes to step two and says, okay, no MFA, but how bad is that? Like, 
do you have, do you not have MFA just on internal assets? Is it just on network switches, or is it on your Office three sixty five cloud? You know, e accessing your email, right? Which is two totally different risks, right? If anyone can log into your email anywhere in the world, that's way different than anyone who can physically get to your plant and navigate their way to some manufacturing machine and then use some custom uh, username and password that they were able to guess. And then all they do is have access to that one machine that's air gapped or whatever, like two, two, two wildly different risks. So by doing that risk calculus, that's the next mature path. And then you get seasoned and senior and then see like basically deputy CISO and then CISO would be the next one, depending on the size of the organization for that career path. And because what's a CISO do besides get budget and direct the team, right? A CISO answers the question from the board or from the CEO or from the executive leadership, like, hey, we heard about you know, whatever, colonial pipeline, ransomware, right? It, can that happen to us? What, are, we, are we at risk of that, right? Uh, unfortunately, they normally ask, are we secure, which is not the right question. But what they're trying to ask is, can that happen to us? What's the risk of us happening? If it does happen, how can we be resilient? Can we continue business operations? If, if it does happen to us, how much is it going to cost, right? It's always about the money, right? So, being able to answer those questions and using that risk experience to be able to qualify and quantify if possible, but typically qualify what your response is. So you can say, hey, you know, we have high confidence that if there was a ransomware incident, the controls we have in place would allow us to recover to a known good state within 72 hours. And, you know, based on the business, the business can operate uh, or not generate widgets or whatever or deliver healthcare. Um, for 72 hours without it being, you know, messing the business up. Or we've talked to business operations, like these segments don't need to be operational, but we're a healthcare company and the physicians and the clinical staff actually have downtime procedures to be able to continue to deliver um, clinical care. They won't be able to access scheduling. So that could be a bit of a hot mess, but we can still you know, generate revenue. We'll stack up the billing. And as soon as the systems come online, we'll submit all the billing. We won't lose any revenue. Like it's these kind of detailed conversations that a CISO is expected to have. And if you're just some slap happy uh, Joe, who's like all about the title, you might actually miss the ability to deliver value and, and, and be able to actually be an effective CISO. But if you do the work and you, and you, you know, go up the ranks, um, you'll understand what it is that you need to be doing. Like you don't, you don't become a CISO and be like, oh my God, what do I do? Like I, this is hello. It's like a new, a new room or something. It's, it literally is just a growth out of that risk role. All right. Well, obviously there is a, uh, some good paths that you can follow. Jerry, you've uh, kind of laid them out there for us. And I, I would say like, and, and, and Jerry, maybe you want to speak to this briefly because we got more questions to get to, but it would seem like, yeah, uh, I, I would agree with you. A lot of people do come up that GRC path, starting an audit, moving through these things and understanding. But man, is it really nice when a CISO has, I'm not saying they've got to been, have been an engineer at any point in time, but having some technical capabilities helps them understand what their team can and cannot do. And that way they don't overpromise what their team can deliver to their, you know, the, the board or whatever at that point in time and they come and go, guess what? I just, I just made a big giant poo sandwich and everybody gets to eat it because <laughs> I promised the world and you've got to deliver. So it is nice when I find a CISO that's like, well, I know what they can do and I know what's realistic. Do you, do you find that to be true as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I made the comment earlier about technical yeah. or, or the business side, but, but what I should, okay. So thank you for qualifying that in order to be effective, you will like, you will need to understand the technical sides. You don't need to be able to sit down and operate you know, Splunk and be able to pull logs and determine if beaconing's there. But you do need to understand what indicators of compromise are and be able to uh, direct your staff, your SecOps engineers uh, into a direction like, hey, like as the GRC guy, like I'm seeing an uptick in activity in Vice Society, right? I work in higher education. They just took down the LA County school system. They took down another school system. We should focus on at least understanding if we, how vulnerable we are to the uh, TTPs of Vice Society. Hey, SecOps guys, can we can we work this in over the next two weeks? Like you have to be able to have that conversation and understand what they're saying. You cannot um, you cannot just show up and be like, you know, I, I see this sometimes and it, it doesn't work out well. But you know, like the you know CFO is also in charge of information security because <laughs> some organizations report it up that way, and it's not. Even though InfoSec is a cost center, you. You cannot do the risk part of the job 
effectively if you don't understand the technical parts because how are you ba- risk is two simple things the likelihood of the event happening and the impact of the event happening right is is it going to happen and if it does how bad is it and if you don't understand the technical stuff you can't you can't say how likely it is cuz you don't know that multi factor is reducing the risk or that you know your you know privileged access management controls is reducing the likelihood of that event happening and that you have network segmentation so if they do get in and pop it the the impact is m- mitigated because they won't be able to move laterally or you know from a recovery perspective we have immutable um a database backups of everything taken daily so we can recover within 16 hours like you have to understand what those terms mean and and understand that or you definitely won't be able to do the CISO job effectively. Again, you don't have to be like a hardcore software developer programmer. You don't have to be able to like go in the data center and rack and stack, um, you know, a, a firewall or something like that. But you do have to understand the technologies and what they're doing. Well, there you go. We do have, hopefully have a lovely path to help you get to your CISO dreams. Yeah. Uh, eventually. Now that said, I know we got uh, more questions, so let's get to Victor's question. He says he wants to get into forensics. Do you transition from like I don't know a help desk and the two? He's he's kind of setting up a scenario for us. Do we go help desk, knock, then sock, or like what would be a good path? If I had to ask Jerry, hey, look, Jerry's right in front of us. Jerry, how would you get into the forensic world? Uh, mm-hmm. If that was your stock and trade, I will say forensics is interesting work. They do a lot of very cool things. So I totally get you, Victor. I see what you're, where you're coming from, and, and I understand. I'm sure Jerry does too. But what would be your path if you had to lay it on the line? What would you say? It definitely froze there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the internet hiccuped that. on us. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, what would be my thoughts on path? A hundred percent agree. Forensics is wicked fun. Um, I will say that you got to be careful though, because it can be incredibly time consuming because it's impossible to prove a negative. So you don't know if you've exhaustively finished your, your forensics research. Um, but if you find something then you can be like, Oh, I found something. I can move on to the next thing. Now forensics does fall into a blue capability. Uh, so a defender capability. So being in the sock uh, actually would probably lend itself to be able to uh, get into forensics. Uh, reason being you working in a sock, and you know a piece of malware comes on to um, an endpoint, right? And you know it's not really busy that night, so you you clean up the the endpoint and you get everything. But then you 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 know either like you throw it into a a sandbox and you detonate it. You start looking at it. Maybe you have time. You put it in a VM and and tear it apart and start looking at it in IDA IDA Pro or you know Wind Debug or something like that. So the SOC will enable you to do you know forensics type work or forensic explore forensics as a capability um while you're still at your job so you won't have to do it as like after you get home from like a, a hard shift and you you know socks notoriously have uh, or can have mental health issues from burnout and alert fatigue and stuff like that so y- you can actually parlay it into your work plus because that is kind of where the forensics works happening you might be able to identify someone who's really good at it or identifies with it and get mentorship from them now if I was going to transition into forensics or any other job, as I mentioned earlier, I would begin to engage. Uh, yes, this is the professional path, but also you should uh, complement that professional path with uh, engaging in a, in networking. Right? Find a, 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 a forensics you know community. Find a community that's into forensics. By the way, it depends what forensics you want to do too. Right? Like you could be an Android m- mobile malware forensics expert. You could be iOS. Right? You could do network type forensics on PCAPs. You could like you could go really really specific in a certain area. So find what your passion is. Start networking with those individuals. A lot of people who are passionate about stuff end up doing it for a living. So you might be able to be oh. Hey, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to get in forensics. I see you're in forensics, like any tips, right? Oh, this is how I did it. Cool. Oh, Hey, I found this challenge. I did this CTF. I'm ripping apart this malware and I can't figure it out. Right. You start, start networking, start engaging, start delivering value. And then people will know that you're looking for a forensics job or you would love to get one and going back to networking, that is definitely going to help you get access to a larger swath of opportunity. But, but the, the TLDR, I would definitely say if you could, if you could get right into a sock, go right into a sock. But it's not unrealistic to go help desk sock, sock analyst too. Uh, you know, dabbling with forensics and then forensics on the side. Uh, also, a lot of like law enforcement work 
for forensic stuff gets outsourced. So you could look for boutique companies that specialize in that. I'd also recommend, like definitely recommend getting experience with either autopsy or FTK, uh, which are two popular uh, forensics platforms or forensic solutions. Any forensics job you're going to do, like practically in, in corporate America, is going to ask that you have some skill with uh, with one of those. And, you know, it, the skills are transferable because the way you do forensics work is is a methodology, not necessarily a platform dependent uh, skill set. So that will help you when you're ready to step in front of the interview or the hiring manager and be like, I got this, like, boom, mic drop. Or you know, Ida Pro drop, if you will, for forensics. Yeah. There, there's also a few certifications out there that are geared toward forensics. So if you're interested in that, you should start looking into those. One of my uh, favorite things that mm -hmm. I pass along to people that are interested in forensics is check out DFIR Diva. Uh, they got a oh, uh, so great, good. great yeah. website, lots of resources there to help you start to like build that path towards your end goal. So check out her website. It's amazing stuff there. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel you. I, I can't blame you for being interested in it. And I, best of luck to you on getting down that road and becoming some sort of a forensics investigator in the digital world. So we got another question, as we do, right? People with their great questions. This is from, uh, hopefully I'm saying this correct, uh, Verinder. It says, I'm in an IT support role. Is ISC Squared certified in cybersecurity certification a good path or maybe there's another road less traveled that I should go down. What would be your advice on this one, Jerry? Yep. So I, you know, I personally think ISC Squared is a great organization. They, you know, famously have the CISSP, which is considered kind of a, you know, a professional standard in the information security space. Um, certified in cybersecurity certification, absolutely good, good idea. I would personally also recommend uh, CompTIA Security Plus. Uh, specifically because that seems to be the certification. Yes, it's a very entry-level cert, uh, and a lot of hiring managers for years have hooked on to that particular cert as part of the requirements uh, needed. Also, uh, at least in the United States, if you're going to work in the DOD space, the DOD 8570, you can Google it, lays out what certs are required for what positions in the government and they use like a crosswalk matrix thing and security plus is like littered all over the entry level roles so it will give you value this particular one though because isc squared is respected within the community i definitely could see uh value in it and you know being able to kind of shop it around and again if if you're um you know looking as far as a path to move from it support into infosec um you know, definitely, definitely take advantage of networking. And, you know, I don't want to talk too long, uh, uh, Daniel, because I feel like I'm taking a long time on all these answers. But I would just suggest to Verinder, uh, in addition to getting your cert, you should also share with the InfoSec team at your work that you're doing IT support for, or whoever you talk to that you do IT support for, that you are studying for the certification. Let them know that you're into cybersecurity and you're being proactive to better yourself, to be a more marketable analyst or engineer in the space, because they're going to want to talk to you and, and want to know why you're doing it. What are you interested in? And that's, that is the, the first steps to networking, right? So that's, that's just, just a pro tip on that. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more because it's it's great to have a bunch of experience and knowledge, but if you're not telling people that I'm interested in this and I'm being proactive in it, I'm contributing to the community by you know going to conferences or being a part of cool LinkedIn groups or Discord servers and YouTube channels and doing blogs and and just everything you can do to get it out there that that is your passion and that is something you're very interested in, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So make sure that you're engaging in all these ways and all these things so that you can get that out there. And it's going to put a bee in the bonnet so the people that can help you eventually get to where you want to be in that world. So really good stuff. Uh, let's see here. I think we're going to another question. Wait for it. There it is. It's coming from Adam. It says, uh, I wanted to do a crash course, or if I wanted to do a crash course, will the GRC masterclass be enough? Any additional resources or certs that I would want to pile on top of that? Or is GRC Masterclass uh, all-encompassing and it's everything I ever needed and wanted and more? <laughs> so I assume that Adam is interested in a GRC analyst role, uh, you know, because the GRC Masterclass, it, it will help uh, complement your skill sets. But if you're looking for like a pen tester role, there's other certs that you could focus on. So uh, right. with, the, with the assumption that he's interested in GRC, what I would um, say is, 
two things. One, I made the GRC masterclass. Uh, and if, if for those who don't know what it is, I created a course um, that is called the GRC Analyst Masterclass. And I'll, I'll drop a link or just connect with me on Discord. I'll send it to you. But basically, I got asked multiple times, where can I get GRC training? Like, And I never had a good answer. And after a while, I got kind of embarrassed that I didn't have a good answer. So I literally made this course so I could have a better answer. Now, the course to me is an excellent crash course. It is comprehensive because I literally give you a cyber, I give you a primer on technology because you do have to know some basics, right? Then I cover all the aspects of GRC, which is audit, compliance, governance, security awareness, and risk. And then I have a section on how to actually get a GRC analyst job, like a whole a whole section on how to do your LinkedIn, your resume and interview and all that stuff. So you do get a certificate uh, or certification at the end of the training that you can put on your resume. I will say, you know, I'm not I'm not out there trying to uh, be a certification body and, and people like ISC squared or something like that. But I have been told by more than one person and this this thing only came out in March. I've been told I was told just yesterday that someone was hiring a candidate and two of the candidates had it on their resume and they knew that the hiring manager knew what it was and it 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 influenced their decision on selecting them to advance. Again, your mileage may vary, but there like there's not a lot in that space around GRC. So I think it's awesome a to benefit you on understanding how to do the job and what the scope of the job is. And then two, being able to demonstrate to others that you understand uh, what it is. And, and another uh, another uh, part of it too is that my course actually has practical labs in it, which if you guys aren't familiar, like it's easy to do practical labs in red tests, in red uh, courses and in blue courses, because it's very technical. It's easy to spin up a VM, have a problem and you fix it or have a VM and you break into it. With GRC, as Daniel mentioned earlier, it, it can be boring. It Like, whoa. It's just audit. It's just compliance. Well, I put labs in there. Like, let's do an audit. Let's do a risk assessment. Let's build security awareness training material. So you're getting practical skills, which is at the beginning, I said, the most valuable thing right now. Hiring managers are are, are, are prizing experience and practical skills over other things right now, uh, just because of budget cuts and needs for staff to help solve problems today. Well, Jerry, you definitely did a lot of the heavy lifting because building those infrastructures so that people can take advantage of them is probably the biggest roadblock to getting started is you don't have a resource. And if you have to build it yourself, then that that becomes a roadblock in and of itself is that I got to make all these things and, and then spin them up. And I already know what they are. So it's kind of I've got some confirmation bias that's going on because I, I know what to do. So it's great that you've made that available. And we really appreciate that out in the community. I know I speak for just about everybody, because when we give back to everybody out there that's trying to either get into this business or stay relevant in this business, it can be really difficult. So when we all come together and kind of create these resources that we can all partake in, we it's it's much appreciated. So thank you very much, sir. And speaking of thanks, thank you for coming on. Looks like we've come to the end of the old podcast. And uh, man, it was a great having you on. We had a great conversation, answered a lot of really great questions from the chat. Thank you, viewers out there, for watching us. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled for the next time that we're going to get together and have ourselves a little intimate podcast. Who knows who will be on? But we definitely had a great one today. So thanks again, Jerry, and thanks for everybody for watching. Until next time, have a great day.